So thanks for joining us today at New City. And I just want to say this before I begin. I was talking to a family in our church that's from the Philippines. And I was asking them when they do Christmas decorations there. And, you know, they don't have to deal with Thanksgiving. And uh, so they say some people in the Philippines start putting out their decorations in September. So some of y'all that are like, wait till after Thanksgiving. Listen, if you just want a month of happiness in your life per year, that's, up for, that's good for you. But for the rest of us, we're already there. Um, it has nothing to do about anything. I just wanted to get that off my chest. Listen, as I start today, uh, there's a, a favorite story of mine uh, of a guy who's just dealing with all these physical ail- ailments. All of a sudden was feeling fine, starts feeling terrible. And so him and his wife, they rush to the hospital uh, to try to figure out what's going on. And they do all these diagnostic tests. They're trying to figure out what's going on. And so he's sitting in the hospital room trying, awaiting the results to figure out why all of a sudden was he feeling great, and now he almost feels like he's going to die. And so the the doctor comes into the hospital room and asks uh, the wife if he could speak to her in his office privately. And so she goes into his office, and she says, so doctor, tell me, is he going to live? Like, what's going on? The doctor says, well, I've got good news and bad news. Uh, The bad news is he's not doing well at all. The good news is he can live if, for the next year, he experiences no stress. That's the only way through this. So when he comes home from dinner, for, from, from work, meals got to be made. When the kids are acting up, you got to deal with it. If he wants to spend the weekend with his boys, it needs to happen. The chores, he can't do them. Whenever he wants to be intimate, you have to do it. He can experience no stress for the next year. And if that happens, he will live. So they leave the uh, office room. She walks back into the hospital room. And her husband says, so hey, well, what did he say? And she looks at her husband and she says, you're going to die. Like, she ain't going to do that. It's way too, way too much work. Now, I share that story because today we're looking at this question, okay? How can we be restored to God, right? In this fictional story, the wife was not willing to do all of that work to restore her husband to health. But for us, for you and for me, in the midst of our sin, our brokenness, our going our own way, in the midst of God being wholly other and different than we are, what does it take? How can you and I be restored to fullness and health and joy in God? How can we be restored to him. That's the question we're going to look at this morning as we continue our time in Genesis. And so if you have a Bible, will you turn with me to Genesis chapter 45? Listen, we're only a few more weeks away for being done uh, for Genesis. So for those of you that have been here for most of it or for all of it, uh, good job. <laughs> I don't know if those woos are like, I can't, I can't believe we're done. I'm so excited or what, but I'm going to say it's because you've enjoyed it. That's what I'm going to, that's what I'm going to think. So, uh, 45 and 46. Now we're getting towards the end. If you've been with us the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at the story of Joseph. So you have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then Joseph. God calls Abraham and says, I'm going to make you into a great nation. Out of you, I'm going to bless the entire world, through which we know he's referring to Messiah Jesus. Uh, Every generation has blown it, has been unfaithful. And finally, we get to Joseph, who's been faithful. He's been honoring the Lord. He's been a high character guy. And then he gets sold into slavery from his brothers because they're jealous of him. He then gets thrown into prison for being falsely accusing of doing something he didn't do. He's trusting God, and every single time it gets worse and worse and worse. Long story short, he, Pharaoh has some dreams. Uh, Joseph is known as a dream interpreter, so he interprets these dreams for Pharaoh. He says there's going to be a famine for seven years, and there's going to be seven years of blessing. And so long story short, uh, Pharaoh says, we need somebody to overrun, over, oversee Egypt in terms of gathering up the grain over the years of plenty, so when the famine comes, we'll be okay. So uh, long story short, Joseph gets put into this high position of honor. He's he put into the place of Egyptian royalty, and he's basically running the country when it comes to the food supply. So they have seven years of abundance where they take all this grain, they store it up, and now they're in seven years of famine where not just Egypt, but the surrounding nations are being struck. And so last week we saw Joseph's brothers come to Egypt for the first time to buy grain. There's a whole thing that happens and they they come back to Egypt a second time because Joseph is testing his brothers to see if they've changed to see if they change, if they're really about themselves, or because Joseph was no longer here, Benjamin was now the favorite son, would they still treat Benjamin with love and respect? And we ended with Benjamin uh, being thrown in jail. Uh, basically, they, they kind of put this royal cup in Benjamin's sack on their way back as they were leaving Egypt, to, uh, and, they cu- and they go after him, they find this royal cup in the sack, and they basically say, Benjamin, you're going to be enslaved for the rest of your life in Egypt. And so Judah is pleading on behalf of Benjamin's sake, doing all these things. Please let Benjamin be free to return back to her father. And then at the end of chapter 44, Judah says this to Joseph. He says, take me, put me in prison. Take my life for Benjamin. So all I have to say, his brothers have passed the test. It's been over 20 years and they have changed. Judah says, take my life. Let put me in the place of the favored son. And in response to that, chapter 45, verse 1, Joseph, it says this. 
Joseph could no longer keep his composure in front of all his attendants. So he called out, send everyone away from me. No one was with him when he revealed his identity to his brothers. His brothers had no idea it was Joseph. But he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it. And also Pharaoh's household heard it. So after Judah's speech of saying, take my life for Benjamin, Joseph can no longer hold it in. So he sends everyone outside of the room except for his brothers. His brothers have changed. His dad is still alive, who he hasn't seen in over 20 years. And so his brothers uh, came back again with Benjamin. They, They convinced their dad, Jacob, to allow Benjamin to come to Egypt. And over 20 years of his life, emotions come flooding out. I mean, this is, this, is a, this is quite a moment for Joseph. You've talked to your brothers twice now. You've put them through all these tests. And now you can no longer hold it in. You reveal who you are. Verse 3, Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Remember, the Joseph they sold into slavery all those years ago. Is my father still living? But they could not answer him because they were terrified in his presence. So Joseph here, he's facing his brothers again. He now asks if his father, so no longer their father, as he said in the past, is his father still living? He reveals his identity, identity that this is Joseph. Now, when he says, this is my father still living, he, he knows he's still alive because his brothers have said that. This is more of a question of how is my father doing? Of course, his brothers here, they're too shocked and afraid to answer. Again, they sold him into slavery. And now that he's, he's this high governing Egyptian official, he's in the ruling class of Egypt. Like he could kill them. He could throw them all in prison for what they did to him. They are terrified because they found out this is actually Joseph. Now, I don't know for you, if there's ever been a moment in your life where you were really afraid to be found out because you would get in a lot of trouble. Um, this, <laughs> I don't know if this is embarrassing or not, but I'll just share it with you. Uh, there was a phase, I know I'm not the only one because someone else was telling me about this. There was a phase when I was a kid, maybe like 10 or 11, where I didn't want to take a shower or a bath. Now, you might be saying like, that's pretty normal if you're a guy. But what I did is I would pretend so I would like turn on the shower and just like let the, the, the water run. Now, of course, I was smart about this. So I put my head under the sink to get my hair wet. So obviously I took a, right? But I, I, don't know, I, I, I don't know why I didn't want to. I didn't want to. Um, but there was one time I was at my grandparents' house. We'd be on this like vacation with them. And the next day, my grandmother was going to bring us back home. I was going to meet my mom for lunch to, to pass off me and my brothers. And I, didn't, I, did this, I did this spiel. And so my grandfather asked me after if I had, if I had taken a shower or a bath. And for whatever reason, I was panicking because I was like, oh, they're on to me. And so I said bath. And he said, well, that's interesting because I just went into the bathroom and the back of the bathtub wasn't wet. And I was like, oh, gosh, why did I say bath? I should have just said, right? So I'm like, and so they said they were going to tell my mom the next week. Now, I don't know what it was like in your house, but in my house, if my parents said I was in trouble, I was always in trouble. There's no getting out, getting out of it. And so I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm going to die. So I, I would go, we meet my grandmother for lunch, and the whole time we're there for lunch, I'm just waiting for her to tell my mom that I, like, lied and haven't been taking a shower. And I'm just, like, terrified the whole time. I had to go to the bathroom, but at one point I was like, as soon as I go to the bathroom, she's going to tell her. Like, she's waiting for me to leave. But towards the end of the meal, I couldn't hold it in anymore, so I go to the bathroom, and the whole time I'm going to the bathroom, I'm like, I'm dead. Like, this is it. Like, I, I, and all that said, I came back, and my mom, like, nothing had changed. Like, my mom didn't look at me any different. I was like, she didn't tell them. She didn't tell them. Now, as an adult now, you know, like when your kids are doing stuff, you feel like you get away with it. And now I'm like, no, they knew. So I don't know. For whatever reason, she didn't, I thought I was good. Like she didn't tell my mom, like I was safe. I don't know why I thought I would get like in so much trouble, but that's just what I did, right? I got away with it. Now for Joseph's brothers, they did it. They think we sold him into slavery. He pleaded with us not to do so. Now he's in charge. We're begging him for food. What is going to happen? So they're terrified. Verse four, it says this. Then Joseph said to his brothers, please come near me. And they came near. I am Joseph, your brother, he said, the one you sold into Egypt. And now don't be grieved or angry with yourselves for for selling me here because God sent me ahead of you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years and there will be five more years without plowing or harvesting. In other words, the famine is going to last five more years. Verse seven, God sent me ahead of you to establish you as a remnant within the land and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. Therefore, it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh, Lord of his entire household and ruler over all the land of Egypt. 
So, so Joseph goes on to comfort his clearly shocked and terrified brothers. He doesn't con- condemn them. He doesn't like put them in their place. He doesn't do anything like that. Instead, he is kind to them. He says that God used them to establish his own purposes, that what they meant for evil, God meant for good. He's, he's literally actually going to say that in, in Genesis 50. It's one of the most well-known verses in all of Genesis. But he's kind of alluding to that here. Like, you meant this for evil, but God and his providence meant it for good. And now Joseph wants to rescue them and his family from the famine that's still going to last another five years. So the first thing we see in this text that the Genesis 45 and 46 is showing us is this. That is that God's grace is greater than evil. God's grace is greater than evil. In other words, what they meant for evil, God was better than. Now, I want to be clear here. This does not mean that you can always do whatever you want and it doesn't matter. Like, let's be clear. What his brothers did was evil, wrong, and wicked, right? In fact, his brothers are right to be terrified of their situation given what they did to Joseph. They gravely sinned against Joseph, and it was not okay. Now they're being confronted with what they have done. Now, for us, I want to say this, for those of us that are followers of Jesus, that if you are walking with the Spirit of God, if you have rhythms and practices in your life that attune you to God's Spirit, your sin will lead you to conviction. So not shame, uh, not guilt, but God's Spirit does convict us of our sin if we're pursuing Him to lead us to righteousness, but our sin in and of itself is wrong. But in God's grace, he gives us something we don't deserve, that he gives us forgiveness. And that is what Joseph is doing here, that Joseph is extending forgiveness and grace to his brothers, that what they meant for evil, God's grace is actually going to lead it to be something greater than they could have imagined. So just for us in our life, again, we're we're thinking about this, how can we be restored to God? We need to remember that his grace is greater than any, any evil or wickedness or doubt that we experience in our life. And then in verse 9, he continues, it says this, Joseph says this to his, his brothers, return quickly to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me Lord over all Egypt. Come down to me without delay. You can settle in the land of Goshen and, and be near me. You, your children, and your grandchildren, your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. Verse 11, there I will sustain you. For there will be five more years of famine Otherwise, you, your household, and everything you have will become destitute. Look, your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin can see that I'm the one speaking to you. Tell my father about all my glory in Egypt and about all you have seen, and bring my father here quickly. So Joseph wants his brothers to return back to the land of Canaan. This is probably an over a 500-mile trek, just for if you're interested, if you're interested to know like how this is going to work. This is a long journey. He says, tell them, tell their father that Joseph is actually still alive. Tell their father what he's doing, how he's overseeing the distribution of grain. And then tell them that he wants them to come and settle in a land called Goshen. Now, the, the exact spot of Goshen in the kind of Egyptian area is disputed, but it likely would have been an area that was good for herds and shepherding, uh, especially Especially in the, in the, in the region that where the, the Jacob's family was living, uh, herding and shepherding was a big thing. In Egypt, it wasn't as big just because you would use the Nile, like life sustainability was just a little bit different. And so they would need a place for all their herds to live and be sustained in. So it was somewhere in the land of Egypt uh, that Joseph could trek to and visit as he wished. And also, it's helpful for us to know that the, that the Egyptians, we know historically and biblically, that the Egyptians didn't like the Hebrews. They didn't like uh, to uh, invite them into their culture. So even as they moved to the land of Egypt, it still allows the Israelites to be a distinct people because the Egyptians don't want them to assimilate. So he says, go home, uh, tell my dad. Now, you can imagine how that conversation is going to go. Remember we told you that he was killed by wild animals? Well, here's the thing. Uh, that would be great. And then verse 14, it says this. Then Joseph threw his arms around his brother Benjamin and wept. Now, Benjamin was his only full brother. All the other 10 brothers were his half brothers. He threw his arms around his brother Benjamin, and Benjamin wept on his shoulder. Joseph kissed each of his brothers as he wept, and afterwards his brothers talked with him. So eventually the terror goes away. It seems that Joseph genuinely cares and wants good for his brothers, even in the face of the evil they committed to him years ago. 
Like, it kind of makes me think of, like, this reunion where they're, like, they're hugging and they're weeping, and it's like, it's actually him, and he loves us. It kind of makes me think of the, those videos you watch when the soldiers return home and surprise, like, their, their parents or their spouse or their kids. And it's like, every time you watch those videos, I don't know for you, but, like, dust always gets in the air every time that you watch those videos. It's just like, and I feel like that's what's happening here, right? And again, I just want to say, can you imagine this conversation? They thought he was... If he was even still alive, certainly not a ruler. Uh, and Joseph reveals himself to him. They go from terrified to like shocked to like grateful to forgiven. I mean, what a conversation. What a conversation. And so what happens next is then the news then reaches Pharaoh that Joseph's brothers have come. And so in response to all Joseph has done to prosper Egypt uh, during the famine, Pharaoh sends word to Joseph that he should bring his entire family to come and dwell in the land of Egypt. He says that they'll be taken care of. And so that's what happens. Joseph's brothers head back to the land of Canaan with extra clothes, money, and food and animals that they can use to bring back their entire caravan back to Egypt. So they go back home with even more stuff, even more wagons and all these things so they can bring all their things, the massive family, back down to Egypt. And on the way, Joseph tells his brothers not to argue and quarrel as they go home. It's kind of probably like, don't blame one another. Don't point the finger at one another. Listen, you're forgiven. It is okay. Especially when you explain this to our our dad, right? Because some of you are going to be like, it was his idea. He said to lie. He said to do this. Just don't do it. You're forgiven. Do not fight. Just tell him what happens. If Joseph forgives them, they should forgive each other. And they should even forgive themselves. And again, as we see in the story of Joseph, how it oftentimes is pointing us to Jesus, how Jesus is the fuller and better representative of Joseph, what we see in the story, what we need to be reminded of, is that we shouldn't reject the forgiveness of God. We shouldn't reject the forgiveness of God. See, sometimes the issue is not that, um, that God, the issue is not that God isn't willing to forgive us. But I think for some of us, the issue is, is, is our willingness to believe it. Like in Christ, that Jesus took our sin, our death, our, our, our punishment, the wrath of God on his shoulders so that we could experience the grace and mercy of Jesus. For many of us, our problem is that we just don't believe God can do it, or we don't believe we are worthy of it, and therefore we don't accept it. And what Joseph is telling his brothers here is that you should not reject the forgiveness that I'm offering you. For us, when it comes to Christ, our thing is not will he forgive us, but will we accept it? Will we trust him at his word that his grace is sufficient for our weakness? It's not that he isn't willing to forgive. Sometimes it's our unwillingness to believe that he will actually do it. And so Joseph tells his brothers, don't fight. Don't quarrel. quarrel. I don't even know if I'm saying that the right word. Just don't fight. Let's just keep it with that. Don't fight, right? I've forgiven you. I just want to say, some of you are here this morning, and you're beating yourself up, and you think about the thing you did 10 years ago, and it brings you so much shame and embarrassment every time it comes to your mind. And hear me, what you did might have well been wrong and evil and wicked. I'm not disputing that at all. But you need to know that God is willing to forgive you in Christ. Will you accept it? So verse 25, it continues. It says this. So they went up from Egypt, his brothers, and came to their father Jacob in the land of Canaan. They said, Joseph is still alive, and he is ruler over all the land of Egypt. Jacob, Jacob was stunned, for he did not believe them. Now, it doesn't tell him, like, did they, t- I just wonder, like, did they t- actually tell her dad? We actually didn't, he actually didn't die. He was thrown in a well and sold into uh, slavery, and that was our opinion. Uh, that's what we did. Or did they kind of be like, yeah, we thought he died too, but who, what do you know? He's there. You know, I don't know. Who knows what they said? Verse 27. But when they told Jacob all that Joseph had said to them, And when he saw the wagons that Joseph had sent to transport him, the spirit of their father Jacob revived. Then Israel said, enough, my son Joseph is alive. I will go to see him before I die. Again, can you imagine this conversation of Jacob being told his son is still alive? Even more so if they were like honest that like actually we sold him to slavery and he didn't die. We lied to you. But regardless, can you imagine this? That over 20 years ago, Jacob was told Joseph was killed by a wild animal. animal. And Joseph was his favorite son. Of course, Jacob initially doesn't believe them. How could you? Not only is he still alive, but you're telling me he's a ruler in Egypt and he's the one that's distributing all this food. There's no way. Right? But after he hears all they have to say, 
and he sees this convoy that had returned, come from with him from Egypt. He believes them, and he wants to see his son. But have you ever been in a situation in your life where you hear like good news that it's just like so hard for you to actually believe? When it hits you like, man, I don't know, is this actually true? Uh, there's this new story, a new city story uh, I love to share. When, back in 2019, we were trying to move buildings. We were about seven minutes from here in a, in a little office a park on Creedmoor Road. The place was too small. And so we've been looking all year for a place. And all, a long story short, the pastor of the church that was here called me and says, hey, I know you're looking for a space. We're looking actually to sublease our facility because we're trying to move out. And long story short, I was like, we're interested, but I was like, here, give me two weeks. Don't tell anybody else who's trying to sublease the space. Like, give us two weeks. Um, let me tell our church. We're going to tell our church that we need to raise 75. We had a couple conversations we landed on. In two weeks, we'll tell our church we need to raise $75,000. The money needs to come in over the next six months. And if we can raise that money, we'll take this, we'll, we will c- commit to take the building. So long story short, we're going to tell our church, hey, in, in two weeks, I need your commitment. If you can give above and beyond what you normally give, if we can get $75,000 in commitment, we're going to move because we're out of space. If not, like no pressure, no guilt, we just, we're going to be st- stuck here. But if we do raise the money, we're going to go. So that was the plan. This was, I, I remember this uh, clearly in my mind. It was a Thursday morning. I, I get off the phone with him. We, we kind of we come up with this plan um, that we're going to ask our church over the next two weeks to pray and, and ask God what he, they might want to do. And if we can raise $75,000, we'll move. Now I'm thinking, this is a Thursday morning, I get off the phone with the pastor, we, we talk about this. I'm thinking, who knows what's going to happen? And this is a true story. I'm not making this up. An hour later, me and Brian, who was, used to be on staff here at New City Church, we were walking to a pastor's gathering here in Raleigh, where his phone rings. Now, a few months prior, there was a guy at our church that offered, uh, that said he wanted to give stock options to New City, and is that that's something we could do? And we were like, sure, we'll figure it out. And so we had this accountant at our church, and so they kind of set it up so for us to receive stock options. This was like three months ago. They, didn't, they were very nonchalant about it, and we hadn't heard anything about it, so honestly, we weren't even thinking about it. About an hour, I get off the phone, we, we set up this plan. Our, this accountant calls Brian and says, hey, I want to let you know the stock options came through. And Brown's like, oh, and I could hear the conversation. We're like, oh, great. Uh, and the guy says, and do you want to know how much, do you know how much it, it was just to confirm? And Brown's like, honestly, we have no idea. He's never said anything. We haven't talked about it in months. He said, well, yeah, I just want to let you know uh, it was $33,000. And I was, I remember, first of all, there was like this dust thing again. I'm like, what's happening? We're outside. And then second of all, my first thought was, how in the world do you return $33,000 without it looking like fraud? I was like, clearly this was a mistake. I was like, maybe $3,000. Like somebody added an extra number. To the, there's no way. There's no way. And so before we even told our church, we were like a third of the way there. I don't know math. I think that's a third, maybe less. I don't know. We were getting there, okay? We were getting there. Right? I could not believe the goodness of God. Answered a prayer that we hadn't even asked for three months ago. It was amazing. This is where Jacob is in complete stunned disbelief that his son is alive. Verse, uh, chapter 46, verse 1, it says this. Israel, which is Jacob's other name that God had given him, Israel set out with all that he had and came to Beersheba, and he offered sacrifices to the God of his father, Isaac. So Israel, all of his family, all of the people with him, all of their flock, all of their herds, they're going down to Egypt. On their travel down to Egypt, they land at Beersheba, where Jacob worships God. Now, this is a significant location. This is also where his father, Isaac, and even his grandfather, Abraham, both lived for a time. In fact, Jacob here is, or Joseph here is actually, sorry, Jacob is actually uh, offering, uh, worshiping at an altar built by his father, Isaac. So his father, Isaac, built this, uh, this, uh, this place, uh, this place. What I'm trying to say. He built this uh, altar here years ago when Isaac was in the land of Canaan and he was traveling back to Abraham's family to find a wife. That's where Isaac built this. Now he's, Jacob is worshiping there. He's also like, like uh, trying to uh, receive divine assurance from God that this is a wise thing, asking God to protect him as he's leaving the promised land and heading into Egypt. And here God meets Jacob again. It says this in verse two. That night, God spoke to Israel in a vision. Jacob, Jacob, he said, and Jacob replied, here I am. God said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make you into a great nation there. I will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also bring you back. Joseph will close your eyes when you die. God says, I will be with you. I will bring you and your descendants in the future. I'll bring your descendants back into the land of Canaan to possess it. And they will, be, they will turn into a great nation. But you, Joseph, Jacob, you will see Joseph. And at your death, he will close your 
eyes. Now, again, in the ancient world, for most of human history until recently, you would die at home. You wouldn't go to the hospital. You would just die at home. And it was traditional custom that the eldest son would close the eyes of the family, of the mother or the father, when they passed away. Now, Joseph is not the oldest son, but he is the favored son. What God is saying is you will meet Joseph again. And so they, they pack up from Bathsheba and they head back to, all the way down to Egypt, the entire family, all their possessions. And then in chapter 46, you get a list of a genealogy, 70 persons belonging to the family of Jacob who are coming to live in Egypt. Now it is worth knowing that some of the people on this list of 70 haven't actually been born yet. They will be born in Egypt. It's worth knowing that this, the first five books of the Bible began to be compiled as the Israelites were leaving Egypt 400 years later. And so what's happening here is that in the ancient world, uh, the a genealogy wasn't just a list of names. It was trying to communicate a story. So seven and 10 in the Old Testament are numbers of completion. What the author is trying to tell us is that God was faithful to his promises and the entire family is coming to dwell in Genesis. Now, it would be worth noting, there is going to be more than 70 people because they have other people and, and tribes that have kind of joined with them over the years. They have tons of animals. So they, I mean, we don't know for sure, but there's might be a couple hundred people in total who are traveling down. In the ancient world, that's a massive amount of people, right? A, a normal tribe or town would be maybe about 150 people. And so you have this massive caravan coming to live in Egypt. And the point of the gene genealogy is to point to the faithfulness of God, that he has done what he promised Abraham to do all those years before. And so if you look down to verse 28, we'll pick up the story of chapter 46, verse 28. Now, Jacob had sent Judah ahead of him to Joseph to prepare for his arrival at Goshen. Again, Judah was the fourth oldest son, but at this point in the story, he's the son with the authority because the first three had kind of disqualified themselves of that. So he's the one, he's the one that, that talked with Joseph about trying to get Benjamin released, all that sort of thing. He's kind of the leader of his family. When they came to the land of Goshen, verse 29, Joseph hitched the horses to his chariot and went up to Goshen to meet his father Israel. Joseph presented himself to him, threw his arms around him, and wept for a long time. So Judah sets this all up. Again, just remember, if you're with us, chapter 38, Judah has this awful story where he has three sons, and they keep dying, and then he, and then he kind of discards his daughter-in-law, and then he sleeps with her because he thinks he's a prostitute, gets her pregnant, then he wants to kill her until he realizes he's the one that fathered the child that she's holding. And then he's, he rightly, at the end of chapter 38, says that she is more righteous than I am, and, she, and he repents of his evil. It's worth knowing that, that all of chapter 38 has likely happened before this this moment. So you have Judah who's already blown it himself and repented and experienced the mercy of God is now leading the reunification of his brother Joseph with his father Jacob. Also, it's worth noting that Judah was the one who came up with the idea to, to sell Joseph into slavery to begin with. And now he's the one leading the reunification. And then they meet, Joseph and Jacob meets, they weep for a long time, a lot of dust in the air. They're over two decades apart and they're reunified. Jacob thought his son Joseph was dead and likely, even though he had seen all these things, likely probably didn't fully believe that Joseph was actually still alive until he actually met him. Like there's, there's gotta be a part of him that's like, there's no way. There's no way this is actually happening. And then Joseph certainly never thought he would see his father again when he was a slave and then he was imprisoned and thrown into a dungeon. So they meet, they weep. And then verse 30, the last verse, it says this. Then Israel said to Joseph, this is Jacob, I'm ready to die now because I have seen your face and you are still alive. In other words, God has fulfilled Joseph's dreams from when he was a teenager, that his brothers and his family will all bow down to them, that he will lead and he will rule them, that Jacob actually is going to live a little bit longer. But what he's saying here is my soul is at rest, that God was and is faithful and that his family is literally saved. They're saved from the famine and destruction because of Joseph. And then after that, Joseph gives his brothers instructions on what they are to say to Pharaoh when they meet him so that Pharaoh will let his family stay in the land of Egypt. And so now as us for readers, as we're getting really close to the end of Genesis, uh, for again, if you've been with us, you shouldn't be surprised to hear that scripture is a unified story that leads to Jesus. And of course, this text today is actually no different. 
You see, in Luke chapter 2, Jesus is an infant. And Mary and Joseph, not this same Joseph, but Jesus' father Joseph, uh, take Jesus to be presented uh, to, at the temple in Jerusalem. For, so for faithful and devout Jews, those who live near Jerusalem, you would take your, newborn, your firstborn son and you would consecrate him at the temple. Where there is an other, another old man awaiting his own reunion. Let me just read to you what happens. Luke 2, 25, it'll be on the screen. There was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. Now, this is not Joseph's brother, Simeon. This is a different guy named Simeon. The man was righteous and devout, looking forward to Israel's consolation or Israel's savior. And the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he saw the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, he entered the temple. When the parents brought in the child to Jesus to perform for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him up in his arms, praised God, and said, Now, Master, you can dismiss, he's talking to God here, you can dismiss your servant in peace as you promised. For my eyes have seen your salvation. You have prepared in it the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles. In other words, the non-Jews, the whole world, which is God's promise to Abraham that I'm going to make a blessing through you to bless the entire world. This is what this guy Simeon is seeing here. And the glory to your people, Israel. In other words, Luke chapter 2 is, or sorry, Genesis 45 and 46 is mapped on analogy to Luke chapter 2. You, you see these parallels that, that Jacob looks at his son, Joseph, his savior of the family, says, I can, my soul is at peace. And Simeon looks at the savior of the world, says, my, my soul is at peace. That Joseph saved his family, which by the way, is the covenant family of God, through which God would send Messiah Jesus to save the world. And so for us, as we ask this question, what does it look like to be restored by God? Here's what we see. That restoration is given by God. Now, now, now here, 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 let me explain this for a second. This is crucial for us to get this right. You see, our natural tendency, our human tendency is to say God will restore or forgive or bless or promise me good things in the future if I do X, Y, and Z, if I behave better, if I'm more generous, if I do this thing, if I promise to be better, if I do this, God will, or at least he will be much more likely to do this. Now hear me, when we think that, when that is our mindset, what we are actually saying is that restoration is given by us, not by God. It's given by us because we earned it and we did the thing and we deserved it. Now, now hear me, I do not want to discredit the importance for followers of Jesus to live holy lives that are acceptable and pleasing to him. As followers of Jesus, we should do that. But our lives are living in a response to the grace and mercy that God first did for us. Not that we do it and then God responds with grace, that God gave us grace and we respond in a way that is holy and pleasing to him because we've already received the grace and mercy we do not deserve. And so almost every week if you've been with us in Genesis, we are seeing this theme played out again and again and again, that God redeems, God forgives, God is faithful, God is restores. That's what Genesis tells us. And so if you get that wrong, you'll miss the power of the Christian life. If you think I got to white knuckle it and be better, you'll miss the power of the Christian life that God took you in the midst of your sin, shame, doubts, and brokenness and rescued you from the wrath that you and I deserve. The gospel is that God did it and we received it. That Jesus took the wrath and punishment we deserve through his perfect life, death, burial, and resurrection so that we could be invited into God's kingdom if we, uh, like Joseph's brothers, repent of our evil and trust in him. So what we see happening here is that God chose to covenant with humanity, with specifically Abraham's family. God chose to exalt Joseph and to use his story as part of his providential plan for salvation, not just for Joseph's family, but for the whole world. And so God chose to bring Jacob's family to Egypt. God chose to, to save and redeem Joseph through the midst of what he's done. God does all of it. And so I just want to say this, I mean, some of you today, I man, you're weary. You're like Jacob, or you're like Simeon, and you need to see and encounter the God who restores. 
You need to trust the Lord and his grace, and you need to follow him in baptism. That's what you need to do, to stop trying to be better on your own, but to receive the grace and mercy of God. And for some of us who are followers of Jesus, we need to be reminded that it is God who has, who has and continues to restore us, not our own. Last thing I'll read, uh, Psalm 23, verse 3, the psalmist writes this. He, God, not your efforts, not your behavior, not your promises to do better, he restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake, that he invites us in. Restoration is given by God. So as I close, I just want to say this. God's love is something that is received. It's not achieved. It's something that is received. And this makes me think of, there's this uh, social media trend going on right now called girl math. I don't know if some of you have seen it. But girl math is basically a bad math used to justify purchases and spending habits. That's what it is. Now, I think some of these girls are like joking. Some of them might actually be serious. But let me just show you a, a video I saw recently. So there was these, these two girls. And this one girl was looking at this $250 pair, $250 pair of jeans. And she's like, this is expensive. But she starts calculating. She's like, she tells her friend, hey, if I wear these jeans 50 times, it's like $5 per wear. And then, her, which is so far, not bad. I mean, that is true. But then her friend says to her, you know, that's like the price of the coffee that you order at Starbucks. And so she's like, well, I got an idea. On the days I wear these jeans, I just won't go get coffee. Therefore, these pants are free. That's what she came to. <laughs> or, or, or I like to remind my wife that when you buy something that's on sale that you weren't already planning on buying anyway, that's not saving money. So if something that's $40 and it's on sale for $30 and you were not already planning to buy that item, you did not save $10, you spent 30. Okay, you spent 30. Now, here's the thing. In all reality, listen, I don't know much about girl math, but I do know God math. And just, and just look right at me, okay? And God says that you could be in rebellion against God your entire life, the last 10 years, the last five years, the last month, but you can be restored to God in a single day because of what he offers you in Christ. He can do it. He can do it. Jesus takes our sin and our failure and he imputes his righteousness. That's a biblical word that says that, that he gives us the grace and mercy that he has acquired on his own behalf, on his own behavior, on his own perfectness. And he gives it, he places it on you because he loves you and he cares. Hey, thanks so much for checking out this video. We upload new videos every week to help encourage you in your faith in Jesus. So be sure to subscribe to this channel so that you'd never miss a thing.